All right, everyone. Good afternoon. Again, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Aisa Cancholo Banias. I am a senior advisor for the Student Borrower Protection Center. Uh, we are a national nonprofit policy research and advocacy organization working to eliminate the burden of student debt for millions of America across this country. Um, I'm so thrilled to be a part of this uh, timely conversation and would like to thank our partners at the American Association of University Women, the Student Debt Crisis Center, and the Young Invincible for working with us to put on this virtual event today. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping. Um, we will be recording this event for folks who are interested in watching it later um, or tuning back in uh, to hear all of the uh, tidbits that we get from our experts today. Um, and so we will be sharing that out with attendees after the conversation. Um, but yes, so this conversation is absolutely timely because we know so many of us across this country are anxiously awaiting on the Supreme Court to issue their long awaited decision on President Biden's debt relief program, um, which would provide up to 20,000 in life changing student debt relief for, for 40 million for over 40 million eligible borrowers across this country uh, for so many of us. You know, that helpless feeling of being stuck or drowning and what quite literally can feel like a lifetime of student debt is not just hyperbole, um, it's personal. And it's the reality for far too many working families across our country. It's the reality for far too many women, particularly black and brown women who carry the disparate burden of this crisis. So when President Biden announced his debt relief program last summer, many felt a spark of hope. You know, the chance for a reset, the, to finally save for retirement, buy a home and build wealth, start a small business, or even start and grow our families. Um, and for far too long, the issue of student debt was swept under the rug by most policymakers who were quick to try to blame borrowers themselves, despite the fact that borrowers were doing everything our nation's education system told them to do. Pursue a higher education, get that job training, invest in yourselves and give back to your community, and what did they get in return? Mountains of debt thrown into a broken student loan system run by servicers that were more interested in profits than the people they were hired to serve. And I say most policymakers because one in particular has been working to tackle this crisis long before it dominated the national headlines. Uh, Senator Warren, who's joining us today, has been our tireless partner uh, in the movement to cancel student debt fighting the righteous fights alongside us every step of the way and pushing for the big structural changes that our families um, deserve. Years ago, working with congressional partners like Leader Schumer and Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, she introduced legislation laying out the very path to get to debt cancellation via executive action. And not only did she show all of her work, she literally helped to build the national momentum necessary to get it done. Um, and so we are so lucky to have her in our corner and even luckier that she's joining us um, today. So without further ado, it is my honor to introduce our special guest and tireless champion of the people, Senator Elizabeth Warren. Oh, thank you, Aisa. That is such a lovely introduction and such an important statement about how much we have worked together. Uh, this is uh, all of us in this. And I want to say a very special thank you to SBPC, um, to AAUW, to Young Invincibles, and to SDCC for hosting this event. Um, this is the energy that keeps us going. You know, I don't know about you, but I am still in the fight for student debt cancellation for millions of Americans. The urgency of the moment cannot be overstated. Every single day that goes by without debt cancellation is another day a family can't buy their first home, another day that a mom can't afford their medication, another day that a school teacher can't save for their retirement. And let me be very clear, President Biden has the legal authority to cancel student loan debt. If the Supreme Court follows the law instead of playing politics, they will make clear that the Republican attempt to stop student loan debt relief is baseless and that that relief will go forward immediately. But there are over 40 million Americans who carry about $1.7 trillion in student loan debt. And those aren't just numbers. They are millions of lives and millions of families. It's generations of Americans who are being held back 
by a broken student loan system that is rigged against them. Women and women of color in particular are bearing the brunt of this crisis. Women hold two thirds of all student loan debt in this country and black women are more likely to hold debt and have the highest debt totals overall compared with any other group. Now, over the past few months, I've heard from hardworking women all across this country who have shared their stories of being crushed by student loan debt, like Kadria, who had been paying back her student loans for 20 years, then she got sick, lost her ability to work, and now she has medical bills on top of her student debt. Or Tammy, a nurse who struggles to pay off her student debt after a battle with long COVID left her unable to work. Or Latrina, who is working multiple jobs and can barely keep her head above water with student loan payments, housing costs, and medical bills following her wife's cancer diagnosis. Now, fortunately, these are exactly the people that President Biden's student debt relief plan will help. Nearly 90% of debt relief dollars will go to Americans earning less than $75,000 a year. It will completely eliminate debt for about a quarter of black borrowers. It will eliminate all debt for about half of Latino borrowers. It will help the 40% of people with debt who don't have any college diploma, four-year diploma at all. You know, I've been in this fight for a long time. And part of the reason is because it's personal. I have watched in my adult lifetime the shift in America. I was the first person in my family to graduate from college. My daddy ended up as a janitor, but I had a chance to go to school because I went to a commuter college that cost $50 a semester. I then went to a public law school where I got a great education. And I was able to do this because I grew up at a time in America when our country was investing in me and in our future, that opportunity is just not out there today. There are not $50 a semester alternatives. Today, a young person can pay up to 200% more in tuition than what her parents paid when they went to college. And that's just fundamentally wrong. It's why we can't wait for bold action to cancel student loan debt. We can't wait for women all across this country, for women of color, for young people getting their start, for seniors who've signed off on loans to help support their kids and their grandkids' education, for families that have been held back for too long because of the crushing debt burden. Now look, we have come a long way in this fight, and I am so grateful for all of your hard work and for your partnership in getting us to this point. And now I've got an ask for you one more time. I'm asking you to join me, to join all of us here on this call today, to keep fighting, to push student loan debt relief over the finish line. We're not gonna stop fighting until hardworking Americans finally get the relief they deserve. From the bottom of my heart, thank you for all that you do. You have lifted up this issue. You have made it a national imperative. And I am grateful for the work you have put into this. It is an honor to be in this fight with you. Aisa, back to you. Thank you so much, Senator Warren. We are so just grateful to have you with alongside us every step of the way and really never giving up. Um, I know so many folks have just so many questions about what these court cases mean about this relief. Um, you know, today's conversation is really about making it very clear what the stakes are for women and working families. Um, we will definitely dig into those cases, uh, you know, a bit later in the conversation, but just wanted to share our gratitude for you and um, thank you for joining us on, on a very busy week. So we really appreciate you. Thank you thank so much.
And so, you know, as, as the Senator said, student debt relief is legal, um, plain and simple. Um, and really the, you know, we are certainly not going to stop fighting, um, you know, and are very clear eyed that the only thing really keeping millions of borrowers and their families from getting this much needed help um, are just blatantly political lawsuits that have been used to keep this economic relief tied up in the courts. Um, so, you know, it's clear these 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 legal attacks on debt relief are, are direct attacks on women and, and black and brown communities in particular um, that have been burdened by this debt and, and would also benefit the, the most um, if this debt relief, you know, is 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 um, green lighted and allowed to, to get over that finish line. Um, so without further ado, we have an incredible panel of experts joining us today. Um, I cannot wait to hear from them. So uh, let's definitely get started. Um, our first speaker is Gloria Blackwell. She's the Chief Executive Officer of the American Association of University Women, or AAUW. Uh, in addition to her role as CEO, she is also AAUW's main representative to the United Nations. And for 15 years, she's managed AAUW's highly esteemed fellowships and grants program, um, awarding more than 70 million in funding to women and women scholars and programs in the US and overseas. Gloria has been a driving force behind AAUW's signature programs, including its salary negotiation trainings, um, which have reached hundreds of thousands of folks nationwide um, and has worked on pay equity initiatives um, at the national, state, and municipal level. Um, and under her leadership, AAUW has been conducting groundbreaking research, examining the unique ways that student debt hinders women's economic advancement um, and exacerbates racial and gender disparities. Uh, next, we will hear from uh, Natalia Abrams, who is founder and president of the Student Debt Crisis Center. She has been on the front lines of the fight for student loan reform for well over a decade, uh, long before others acknowledged that student debt was a genuine American crisis that required attention. Um, you know, Natalia was in the in the trenches, raising awareness of the scale of the program of the problem and working with both borrowers and legislators on lasting and meaningful solutions. Um, and then we have Kristen McGuire, executive director for the Young Invincibles, a now dedicated to amplifying the voices of young adults in the political process. Kristen was previously YI's West Regional Director, where she spent five years empowering young adults to advocate for higher education healthcare, economic policies, um, and Kristen has years of community organizing and policy change expertise. Um, as a first generation college student from a single parent household, she's driven by a deep understanding of the resource communities um, and it really has helped shift power to young adults in their communities. Um, just a gift, an extra shout out, Kristen is a proud alumna of the California State University at Dominguez Hills, a wife of a military veteran, mother of two fantastic daughters, and a member of the Delta Sigma Theta sorority. Uh, so with that, I'm happy to turn it over to Gloria to share some quick remarks. Thank you so much, Aisa. It's really a, a pleasure to be here with everyone today. I'm very energized to be with anyone, everyone this afternoon to represent AAUW and our 100,000 plus members, donors, supporters, and advocates. I'm just happy to be here with our respected coalition of fighters for economic justice, and definitely especially grateful for the president's, presence of leadership of Senator Elizabeth Warren. Because as she said, let's be clear, student loan debt is crippling women's economic security. Women must constantly prove ourselves over and over again. First, we go to college to get these credentials, and we start out, sometimes even before we land on campus, by needing to take on more and more education debt than men. And if, obviously, you're a Black or Brown woman, you must prove yourself even more. The average Black woman needs at least a bachelor's degree or higher to earn more than a white man with some college but no degree. Then, after finishing a four-year degree, women are required to prove ourselves yet again. We take on another round of education debt for graduate school because we're required to bring even more credentials to the table. And now, women hold almost two-thirds of that 1.7 trillion dollars in student loan debt. Does this sound like equity to anyone on this call? Because it certainly doesn't sound equitable to me. 
So we know that women take on greater debt than men. And as also a first generation college grad, I experienced it firsthand. But when we graduate, the loan payments collide with the lower salaries due to the unrelenting gender pay gap. And even before the pandemic, women who graduated with a bachelor's degree only earned about 81% of what our male peers earned. So none of this sounds equitable, I am sure, to any of us. So our country needs student debt relief because the economic security of millions of US women and their families is on the line. When the gender pay gap, the racial pay gap, not to mention the motherhood penalty collide, it's enough to jeopardize women's economic security for a generation. But when you add this crushing student loan debt on top of it, women's economic security flatlines. Earlier this month, AEW celebrated our 38th annual national conference for college women student leaders, welcoming nearly 450 students from 200 campuses across the country to convene with us and to learn skills and forge their future pathways. It was amazing. But if you look at the data, and we and our peers published plenty of it, many of our student participants sadly own part of that over 900 million, a billion in student loan debt held by women in our country. And we at AUW truly hope that those women are the last generation to be unfairly burdened with education debt. So, AEW will continue. It's more than a century long trail toward a future of equity for all. And that means women can no longer bear the growing economic burden of overwhelming disproportionate student debt. We need relief and AAUW doesn't just advocate and do resource research. We put money in pockets and we just awarded $6.3 million to 285 deserving women scholars and community-based organizations focused on girls. They are our present and our future because we know that student debt relief is not merely an economic issue, it is an issue of gender and racial justice. We do truly believe this is a watershed moment to determine our future and that working together, all of us can provide the equity that all women in our society as a whole deserves. Thank you all so much for being here. And now I'll pass it to my colleague, Natalia Abrams. <clears throat> thank you so much, Gloria, and thank you so much for uh, hosting this event and including us and Young Invin Invincibles and Student Bar Work Protection Center. I know that any day that I get to speak to Senator Warren is a great day, and this is an amazing way to start out, not just any week, but this week, where we're looking towards a very big Supreme Court decision coming either tomorrow or Thursday or Friday. We, we aren't sure of the day, but we know the decision will come. Um, and so <clears throat> I have the honor of uh, representing Student Debt Crisis Center, an organization I founded over 11 years ago. Um, it, it will be in August. And we represent 2 million supporters. Want to shout out and thank all the people that have, you know, gotten us to this point, including my amazing team um, full of more than 50% women, proud to say that, and really love you know, it's not just the folks you're seeing here on the call, but our team and then the borrowers and the supporters that have gotten us to this moment. Senator Warren was absolutely right. It is the stories and the advocacy that have changed this moment. As I used to mention, when I was doing this work more than a decade ago, we had a few friends that you see here right now that were doing some of this work, but it was very hard to get anyone to really take this seriously, even though borrowers were struggling and you know, specifically women so much with this issue. It is amazing now to see over 520, 550 organizations support canceling student debt, um, to see so many lawmakers uh, join Senator Warren in the trenches and Representative Presley to really get this job done. And no matter what happens at the court, I can, for, I think I can speak for the women in this room that no one's going away. We know that there's so much work to do helping borrowers and especially helping, helping women student loan borrowers. Lori mentioned it, women hold over $890 billion in student loan debt. That's two thirds of this you know, $1.5 billion crisis. And our supporter list reflects that. When we survey and talk to borrowers from our uh, list, they are, 75% women, you know, most of the time I'm going to be speaking with a woman, um, whether it's deal with their own student debt, their children's student debt, or the family student debt that they all hold. 
and this unequal burden of debt on women and their inability to pay it off once graduated poses a tangible threat to the capacity for women to fully complete and succeed in their personal and professional lives. And at Student Debt Crisis Center, we have surveyed our supporters all through the COVID pandemic. And we know that, you know, from our results, one in 10 women have student loan payments over $1,000 per month. This is based on a student debt crisis center survey, but while the average is 400, we see women going to graduate school and beyond taking on a lot more debt from the get-go and then seeing that debt balloon to quite a hefty student loan payment. 75% of women say it's preventing them from saving for retirement. 44% say it affects basic, being able to afford basic needs. This is a topic that came up time and time again during the pandemic, that the student loan payment pause, payments have been on pause since for the last three years. That has been by far the most beneficial uh, COVID pandemic, um, you know, benefit, I benefit feels like a real weird word, but that people have received. And instead of, you know, no one's going on lofty vacations they are using the money for basic needs, for healthcare, for uh, medicine for their children, to make rent, to make groceries with uh, inflation getting so bad. Um, and we know in terms of inflation that 92% of women are concerned that inflation will make it harder for them to afford student loan payments. So this is just a snapshot of what women tell us here at Student Debt Crisis Center. And I'm just so grateful to share this space today, to be here to start this week. As I mentioned, you know, fighting for student loan cancellation is a progressive policy. We all want to make this world better for the next generation. We hear all the time um, and saw it in a question that, you know, what about the people that paid off their debt or didn't take their debt? An educated population, um, not burdened by mountains of debt is necessary for the security and for the, the benefit of our overall society. We need to all join together to uplift each other and to uplift the next generation. And you know, with that, I'm so honored to introduce my colleague and good friend, Chris McGuire, who is going to take it away. Thank you so much, Natalia. Um, and thank you so much, uh, everyone else. Uh, I'm really honored to be here today. Uh, so I really appreciate the invitation. Um, I guess I'll start a little bit about telling you about Young Invincibles, and then I'll share a little about myself. Uh, my name is Kristen McGuire. I'm the executive director at Young Invincibles. Uh, we're the nation's largest policy and advocacy organization dedicated to uh, economic opportunity for young adults. Uh, we do this by elevating the voices of young people in the political process, ensuring that no decision for young people is made without young people. We work nationally and in our five states, and we directly train and support young adults and develop research and advocacy campaigns across our issue areas of healthcare, civic engagement, workforce and finance issues, and of course, higher education, focusing on very important topics like student debt. Uh, we've worked on higher education affordability and student debt for almost as long as our organization has been around uh, since 2009. Uh, in fact, uh, I did a Google search uh, a year ago and found articles from a former executive director saying, will student loans ever be a national talking point? And this was like back in 2010. Uh, and then there are other articles in 2015 saying, the student loan debt balance is ballooning across America, will young people be able to afford homes? So as you can see, we've been uh, in the trenches with other uh, partners on this call for quite some time, sounding the alarm uh, that a student debt crisis uh, is looming. Uh, this is also one of those areas where the personal becomes political. Um, I am a student borrower. I borrowed $20,000 uh, for college uh, across the time I was there as a first generation college student. And I now owe uh, over $50,000. Uh, and if that's not a broken system, I don't know what is. Now, the troubling part about that is as shocking as that may sound to some, I'm sure no one on this panel, uh, it's very common and it's very standard uh, amongst women and specifically amongst Black women and Latinas. And so when we think about student loan cancellation, 
um, as a gender justice issue, it is also a racial justice issue. Uh, and as we've heard before, um, we know that women hold nearly two thirds of all the student debt in the country. And we know that black women have the highest balances of any other group in our country. So I'm glad that we're framing this conversation around the unequal burden of student debt and how we can start to kind of insert equity into these policies. So yeah, uh, I'm Kristen. I'm a black woman. I'm a first generation college student and I am fighting like hell to fix this unjust system because I'm also a mom of two daughters, uh, one who is entering her fourth year uh, in college. And I have one who's in 11th grade and we will soon be having conversations about how to finance her education. So I'm really excited about this conversation. It's very timely. And I'm really looking forward to uh, our decision that we will hear from our Supreme Court, uh, hopefully this week. Um, and I have my fingers crossed and I am hopeful. Uh, so I think that's all for now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kristen, Gloria, and Natalia. You all left us with so many just very powerful, also infuriating stats and you know numbers that really underline how our status quo has failed so many, you know, so many families. I, I want to say young people, but this is an intergenerational issue. Kristen, as you'd mentioned, thinking through your debt that you have to pay and thinking through the debt that your babies are going to be taking on. Um, and that is a reality for far too many families. Um, Gloria, you left us with a $900 billion number that women alone carry amidst the broader crisis. Um, and that's just mind boggling. Um, and when we think about the impact that President Biden's debt relief plan will have and, and look at it through the racial and, and, and gender justice lens, I mean, we're talking about a half of all Latino owned student debt being canceled as a result of this debt relief. We're looking at one fourth of black owned student debt being canceled, like the opportunities for a reset. Um, and could, you know, we could literally be seeing one of the largest wealth accumulation opportunities for black and brown folks, um, you know, in, 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 our, in, in our lifetimes at least. And, and so I think it is very powerful to kind of bring that to, to the forefront of the conversation. Um, and Natalia, to your point, and one in 10, you know, folks in your, in your list have a student debt bill of over a thousand dollars and thinking through payments restarting potentially in the fall on top of the rising cost of eggs and milk. I mean, that is just a very real dynamic. So thank you all for kind of bringing those points um, together and um, very eager to kind of get started on some of these questions. Um, so Gloria, I will start with you because, you know, AUW has done, as, as we've mentioned, so much research kind of shedding light on the unique ways that women and women of color are kind of driven to have to take on more debt. Um, and the reality is, you know, the, the student debt crisis is both a product and feeds into the racial and gender wealth gap in this country. Um, and that's really what results in women of color carrying the disproportionate burden. Um, this was the case long before the pandemic hit, but we know that the economic impact of the pandemic certainly did not, you know, make sure to, e to be equally distributed across all of our communities. It was black and brown communities that, that disproportionately were, were burdened or, or were hit economically. And, and, and I mean, just from the sheer number of people that we've lost over the last few years. So, you know, I'm curious, how has AAUW seen kind of the economic impact of the pandemic worsen the trends we already saw with the student debt crisis? Um, and why is it so important that debt relief be at the core of like a long-term economic recovery for our communities? Thank you so much, Aisa. I think the, the first point is really the fact that things weren't that rosy before the pandemic, okay? So we can't blame it all on the pandemic because prior to the pandemic, more than 25% of borrowers were behind on their student loan payments and over 9 million borrowers were already in default. And that's especially true for black four-year graduates because they default on loans 
five times more often than white graduates. And as bad as those numbers are, just a slice of the data, the Department of Education data shows that returning to repayment without cancellation will make things even worse. So AAUW has done uh, a great deal of research and our research report Deeper in Debt details how once again that student debt makes it nearly impossible for so many women to afford basic living expenses after graduating from college. Research also done during the pandemic about the perfect storm, uh, it just provided a window into the larger national issue of how quickly all women can fall into financial hardship. It doesn't take much, right? So even before the pandemic, black and brown women were graduating to that pay gap and the pandemic only intensified it, right? And so we also know that in the early months of the pandemic, women filed nearly 59% of the unemployment claims, despite being only half of the labor force. And yes, we have regained some of that ground. So having the federal student loan uh, repayment put on hold during the pandemic was a lifeline for black and brown women and their families because they occupy roles that were disproportionately impacted because they carry more student debt than other groups and they take longer to repay it. So it's really critical to note also that even before that pause, um, many recent and obviously long-term graduates of color already relied on a second or even a third job just to keep a roof over their heads, just to pay for those basic expenses, just to hopefully make ends meet. And that's because, as we all know, that it was due to the ongoing systemic inequities that exist in education, not just in education, but obviously in healthcare, in the workforce, in housing, and so many aspect, other aspects of our society. So of course now, um, as Kristen mentioned and others mentioned with inflation, the cost of rent and groceries, so many products and services, and even tuition, they just continue to rise unchecked. And so if black and brown women must start repaying hundreds and even thousand dollars or more per month in student loans uh, every month, their financial futures could be crushed. And so that means, as we stated, once again, women will be put, put things on the back burner that are important, saving for retirement, meeting basic expenses, paying for childcare. And so we really, we really are hopeful that, you know, we're not going to resume student loan payments without first canceling that student loan debt, because if it doesn't happen, it will result in a catastrophic wave of unnecessary borrower distress and default, additional default, with the impact landing especially hard on Black and brown women. So our country just cannot continue to ignore the ongoing systemic injustices directed toward black and brown women because the financial health of women in all families is tied to the financial health of women. This is why we must deliver on student debt relief and it must be taken, and it may be taken on while individual is a student, uh, but education debt can carry on throughout a career, throughout parenting, throughout caregiving, and even in retirement, as we know so well from so many of the stories um, that we know personally and stories that have been shared. Thank you so much, Gloria. That is so, I, what I appreciate is that you talk about delivering for women in all aspects of our lives, right? So women, people, we don't live in individual little boxes or silos, right? And so the fight to deliver on debt relief is just as important as making it, uh, you know, making a national paid leave policy a reality, right? Which we obviously saw the crushing impact on our families in the midst of the pandemic and the fact that we don't have that available for the majority of, 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 of black and brown workers across our country, um, looking at making childcare affordable. I mean, it's part of a larger effort. Um, and I, I am seeing a question in the chat about, you know, prioritizing our efforts for women. No, it's it's not an and it's it's not a an or it is an absolute must and in that we need all of these systemic um, and structural supports for women and for families um, to support our economic well being throughout the course of our lives and and on the needs of our families and so um, I think student debt in particular is is one piece of that broader puzzle you know to ensuring the economic security of our families protecting our bodily autonomy and our rights to make decisions over our, our, our lives and our economic futures. 
Um, so definitely all one and the same. Um, so thank you for that, Gloria. Um, and so Natalia, wanted to, to turn it over to you because as you had mentioned, you know, this movement in particular has the result of borrowers really stepping out of the shadows and normalizing the their experiences with student debt. For too long, you know, we've seen a lot of folks say, well, you know, you chose to take on this debt. You know, why is it my problem? But the more you hear from borrowers about what drove them to have to take on debt, what, you know, their experiences, as Kristen had mentioned, starting out with 20,000 and now owing 50,000, feeling like you're trying to do everything right, but you just can't get ahead. And so, you know, over the years, SDCC has really brought tens of thousands of these borrower stories to the forefront. Um, and so I'm curious, like, what are some of the most consistent challenges that you have heard over the years? And, you know, I'm kind of curious how we can kind of illustrate, you know, some of the, to push back against some of those fairness questions that I know a lot of folks have is like, well, I pay off my student debt. Why, why do these folks need relief? Um, I'm kind of curious on, on your thoughts on those two pieces. Um, so, you know, to the first part of your question, and thank you for, for that, Ace, it's a great question. You know, we hear exactly what Kristen talked about, I think, the most, that people took out 10, 20, 50, whatever it was, they've been actively trying to pay it back. Sure, they may have been on a forbearance or missed a payment here and there, but generally been in good standing, and yet it ballooned because of interest. And they were told if they were in forbearance about compound capitalizing interest that makes their loan go up even higher. So it's that feeling of I'm doing it all right or trying my hardest to do it right. And yet I'm constantly just seeing my balance grow. And I constantly, for excuse me, lack of a better word, feel screwed over, right? That's just the way people feel trying to do it right. And then that goes in well with the second part of this you know, well, I took out my loan or I didn't go to school, I paid off my loan or I didn't, took out my, I didn't go to school and didn't have loan. What about me is, a, is I, people, I think really, well, first of all, there's people that are always going to do that, right? And we, we just need to ignore those people. But the other mm -hmm. ones do not understand how bad the back end is. They don't understand what the process is to try to pay back your loan. That mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking of Shana from our team who had a traumatic brain injury. And when she, so she just told me when she barely even knew what her name was, she remembered she had a student loan and three months in to paying back, she finally called and she had to make up those payments. They could put her in a forbearance after the fact, just a forbearance, not good enough, but she had to make up for those payments. What do we do about people like that? Where life absolutely, absolutely happened to them and there's no recourse yet. You know, that's where I'm so grateful for all the women and groups in this room. We are, you know, borrowers can come to us. We try our best to help and listen to these stories, but we have to change the, you know, federal landscape to really help these folks. I think of myself personally with the what about is um, I unfortunately got diagnosed with cancer a few years ago. I don't talk about it much, but in the sense that I always think if there is a cure for what I have, or if I didn't have to go through what I had, I just want that for people, right? Like, I don't understand why we want people to be harder off than we were or experience the hardship that we experienced. It, life is not fair, that's what my mom always told me. And I feel like there's this thing pushing back to those people claiming fairness. It's not about that. We want equity and equality for the system and we are not having that now. We see that specifically with women who hold the largest burden of this debt. And the best way to do this is A, cancel the debt, and then we have to figure out something to do with interest. And all I will stress what I said before, all of this is done because of people speaking up, sharing their stories, signing petitions, taking action, and those stories we all read. And that's where we've learned about, you know, that there are millions of Christians. Uh, you know, Kristen, you are unique in your own way, and I love you, but so your story is not unique in the sense that we see this time and time again. And so we have to fix the back end, and we have to let, as advocates, the other side know more and more just how messed up it is. And that the, I mean, the, almost every borrower that's ever called me has not asked for their debt to be canceled, to be honest. They've just asked, how do I pay this off? How do I get rid of this ridiculous interest? Then they get fed up and say, okay, can you just cancel it out of my account because I've been trying for so long. And that's why we believe in canceled student debt. It has become the only option 
for this issue. Thank you so much, Natalia. And thank you for, you know, just being willing to share that very vulnerable and just like raw experience because so many stories behind student debt have very real life, life happens and drives folks into debt um, or, you know, really impacts our ability to, to pay down that debt. And I, you know, I think having a bit of of empathy and compassion for one another, especially when we're in having this conversation around the the importance of debt relief um, is really important. And so I just wanted to also just, just thank you for sharing that with us. Um, so Kristen, you know, you are, are one of a fearless leader of, of one of the largest organizations really working for, for the health and economic well-being of, of young adults, as you had mentioned earlier. Um, and a lot of the times these have been the same folks that have been historically underrepresented in our democracy. And at the same time, um, and perhaps for no coincidence, uh, you know, we have also seen that young people, young black and brown folks in particular, have been found at the center of relentless attacks by policymakers at the court from, you know, policymakers in national level, state level, in the courts alike, um, talking, you know, stagnant wages at as, as the cost of housing and transportation, food and higher education skyrocket, overturning of Roe, we were, we were talking about earlier, um, attacks on abortion access and rights, um, to attacks on debt relief and, and affirmative action. Um, can you speak to, you know, how some of, how these attacks really undermine the economic stability of an entire generation of folks that were already struggling to catch up to generations prior to us? Absolutely. And uh, before I answer that, I just would like to say thank you so much, Natalia, for sharing. Um, I love you too. And um, it's important that we recognize uh, when we talk about women, that movement work is very often held on the shoulders of women. And, um, and that does take uh, an emotional and physical toll on, on ourselves. So I think it's important that you know, we take time to take care of ourselves, make space for ourselves, and I am I'm happy that you're well and feeling better. Um, so I just wanted to say that. Um, and yeah, so first to address your question, I think it's important to know not only are we attacking the economic stability of a generation, we are attacking ourselves as a country when we attack the most the youngest, most vulnerable generations that we have. Um, I also would like to say that uh, millennials and Gen Z, uh, despite everything that people may hear or say, uh, we are the most diverse generations our country has ever seen, and we are the largest voting block. And I think that is important to note as policymakers continue to create policies uh, that disproportionately uh, negatively impact young people. Uh, I'm really glad you framed your question in this way because all of these issues are interconnected. Uh, for young people just looking to make ends meet, the cost of housing, uh, personal debt, student debt, their salaries, they, they aren't separate issues. They all impact, impact their lives, uh, their bank accounts, their pockets, all in the same way. And I think it's important that you noted the connection of reproductive rights because we just marked the terrible anniversary of getting abortion rights in this country over the weekend. And we know that these rights are an economic issue, having the ability to plan their families and decide when they will or won't uh, start a family. Uh, when someone seeks an abortion, it impacts their financial security um, as they are more likely to be in poverty and more likely to drop out of school even years after a denied abortion. And they are more likely to have trouble affording basic needs like food and transportation. So again, it's all connected. Our mission at Young Invincibles is about expanding economic opportunity for young people. And you know, we lead on research to show just what the challenges are on the front. Over the last several years, we've been producing research on the financial health of young adults across America. The first report was back in 2017. And uh, shockingly, we found out that millennials had a net, net wealth that was half of what their parents' generation was at the same age. And a big part of that was student debt at a time when the national total of student debt was about 400 billion less than what it is today. So when we released the update to that report earlier this year, you can imagine uh, the numbers were just as stark, if not worse, when it came to the financial wellness of young people. 
Uh, we looked across a number of metrics and we found that young people are still struggling to find their financial footing after more than a decade of slow economic recovery from the Great Recession. Then we had a pandemic and that was a massive economic disruption and it hit young people hard as it did other groups, but it was especially for young people of color. Uh, racial gaps in wealth, income and financial well-being overall stagnated or worsened in the last decade. Uh, you know, and it's not that it's not that things are exceptionally bad because of the pandemic. It's it's bad. Uh, but for black people and Latino people, it's always been bad. Right. And we continue. I, I heard someone say talk about, you know, going to college and building yourself up. And I say often uh, we are communities where we have consistently been told to bootstrap, pull ourselves up by the bootstraps, work hard, build something of yourselves. And when we do just that and beat the odds, and, and many people here speaking how we're first generation college students, uh, we are then faced with even more intentional barriers. Uh, one, because of our gender, and then two, because of our race. I say that to say bootstrapping can't work if it was never designed for us to succeed in the first place. And that is why student debt cancellation is important because it will give us a head start that we really deserve. We are the people who helped build this country and we just want a shot. And I think when we think about the, when we talk about the financial well being and the economic security of young people, we're really talking, you know, the president says we're fighting for the, the heart and soul of our nation. Uh, we're, we're fighting for the next generation of leaders in our country. We are fighting for investments to be made in our next teachers, our next doctors, our next lawyers, our next firefighters, our next scientists. And the only way that we can do that is by investing in higher education and really placing high importance on that for young people. And, and again, for the most diverse generation in this country, we have to invest in education and not create additional barriers for success. Thank you so much, Kristen. I'm going to jot that bootstrap quote down and just think to myself about it. <laughs> bring it back anytime I need a, a good fire kind of um, thought to keep me motivated because that is so true. So thank you so much for that. Um, Gloria, I would love to kind of bring it back, you know, to the notion that, you know, student debt is a kitchen table issue. It's impacting working families from all walks of life. Um, so, you know, can you just share how does debt relief fit into the larger fight to support women and working families? I'm thinking the fight for affordable childcare, paid leave, fair wages, access to, you know, retirement and, and things like that. Thank, thanks, Aiz. And that's a, that's a really great question because as we know, all of those pieces of the puzzle are interconnected. And, you know, I want to thank definitely Kristen for, for lifting that up, you know, and like her, it's very personal for me as well, because I was repaying my student loans and simultaneously paying for infant care and toddler care and after school care for an elementary schooler. And so, you know, the, the student debt crisis is something that combined with the gender wage gap just really make it difficult for women to get by, even in, you know, a two-parent household where both of the parents are working full-time. It was still a challenge, right? So just trying to keep up, let alone, you know, get ahead. So they're all connected and learning less just has the snowballing effect on every aspect of a woman's life. Um, you know, if, if we're not being paid fair wages, how can we repay those loans? How can we buy those necessities and save for an emergency or even retirement? We can't. Uh, if child care is unaffordable, which for most people it is, millions of families, you are delaying having children, not having children at all because burdened by student debt and the rising cost of higher education. And as AEW reported on our report, Deeper in Debt, again, 74% of women say that they expect to continue education beyond a bachelor's degree because we are constantly propelled by that ongoing need for greater credentials and constantly needing to one up, improve ourselves time and time again. And so graduate school adds on 
an additional, on average, over $51,000 in debt uh, for women. And it brings on an additional huge financial disadvantage for women who are already trying to survive on an already restricted budget, right? So our research underscores the need for a full range of solutions a full range of programs and policies and services to help women you know, thrive in the good times and not just survive in the bad times. And that's why we, can't, we just can't stop at student debt relief because paid leave and fair wages are intertwined with student debt. So like my colleagues, we are pushing for Congress to pass the Paycheck Fairness Act and the Family and Medical Insurance Leave Act so that we can help close the gender pay gap and ensure women receive paid time off for illness, family care, or paid parental leave, because the bottom line, equity for women means that, you know, the choices shouldn't be whether we can pay for necessities or start a family or pay for student loans or pay for higher education. We know that between 1980 and, and 2020, that the cost of higher education increased by 180%. Now, whose salary already behind the eight ball whose salary kept up with that? Certainly not women's. So we should be able to do all of those things. Thank you, Gloria. Um, and I know we are coming down to our last five minutes. I, I would love to ask just really quickly, Kristen, you know, we talk a, a lot of the times there's this false narrative around debt student debt impacting, you know, the young millennial that just wants to spend their money on avocado toast and Starbucks lattes. Um, that could not be furthest from the truth. Um, you know, can you speak to kind of the intergenerational kind of impact that this crisis really has and, and the reality behind that? Absolutely. First of all, I'm allergic to avocado, so I have never purchased avocado toast in my life. So it did not contribute to my student loan debt. Um, quickly, because we are running out of time, I think I'm like a poster child for intergenerational student loan debt. Um, and I didn't realize that until I started talking about it so much. So I went to college um, and I'm first generation college student. I have a brother who's 18 months younger than I am. So he went to college the very next year. Uh, then we were in college and my mom decides to go back to school and retrade. So she went to college. So I'm like first gen and a half, right? Or is my mom the second gen college student? I don't know. So she goes and starts nursing school while I'm in college. We have this family plan. Nobody takes out more than $20,000 because our quick math, that's how much a car costs back in the 2000s. We can pay this off easy. Bam. Uh, false. Did the loan interest exam, loan ent uh, exit exam, still didn't know the difference between defer deferment, forbearance. My servicer never told me. I think back then it was income contingent repayment. Nobody ever told me about that either. And then when it turned to income based repayment, also didn't know about that either. Um, and so that 20 turned to 50. Uh, and then my kids started going to college. So at that point, we're now talking three generations of students, um, hopefully. Mine won't have student debt, but we're all like trying to finance education at the same time. And so that's that's what we're talking about when we talk about the intergenerational issues, because we have to continuously think about how to finance higher education so that we can pull ourselves up again and kind of become what we're fighting so desperately to become while also trying to escape like the student loan trap. Um, and lastly, I think what I would say is. Um, we know what sets white America apart in terms of finance and it's the greater ability to build intergenerational wealth and make sure people who are already in privilege stay in privilege. And we can't, we can't fix that while only certain people are being crushed by student debt. We also cannot financial literacy ourselves out of this issue because the problem is systemic. Interest rates have increased from back when some people got to like Senator Warren was saying where college was $50. Interest rates have like doubled since then. The servicers aren't doing what they're supposed to do. And we're all just in this huge tangled ball of confusion because education has been more expensive since black and Latino people have been allowed to go to college. Thank you. <laughs> that was that was epic, Kristen. Thank you so much. Um, and Natalia, in our last remaining minutes, you know, you've been in the trenches for the last decade plus. You know, this, this movement has been so successful in such a short amount of time. 
what next? You know, the Supreme Court is literally going to rule any day now. What comes next? We keep doing what we're doing. We keep fighting. Uh, you know, it's not over. I have a lot of hope for the court. I really do. I've gone through so many emotions in the past few months, and it's really hard to tell. But either way, the bad, the war, the battle, whatever, it's not over. And I have so much hope. Hope, hope, hope is what I want everyone to take from this. That you know, seeing Senator Warren, I've had the pleasure of working alongside her for over a decade now as somebody in this space. We have moved light years ahead of it. We have now imagined the impossible to be possible. So if it's not tomorrow or this week, it will happen again, but we will all keep fighting. So keep fighting, keep sharing your story and get your own student debt under control and before you help others. That's one of the best advice I can give folks. Get, you know, talk to us, help us control your debt and then join us in the fight of helping to help others. So thank you for this. Thank you, AAW. Amen. No, that was great, uh, Natalia. And so to the, your point, you know, keep hope alive and keep fighting. So regardless of, so we know this week we are going to get a decision on the two cases that will determine, you know, the fate of, of President Biden's debt relief program. Um, if the stu if the Supreme Court upholds the law, which is very clear, this debt relief program is legal. It is just and it is necessary. If they uphold the the letter of the law and allow this program to go through, um, the work remains. We need to make sure that this debt relief is implemented swiftly. There have been only 16 million people who have been, which is a huge number. So not only um, 16 million folks who are already approved for debt relief, um, but millions more that had applications submitted and still need to get processed. We have millions more, about 20 million additional folks who were not even able to get an application. And so spreading the word to your community, your your, your family, your friends, um, that work still remains. And, and we are certainly all in on making sure that folks get the debt relief that they um, deserve. If the Supreme Court decides to put politics ahead of people um, and strike down this program, you know, we are not letting up. Um, the, the HEROES Act, which is the legal authority that President Biden used to center this, this program, has always been only one of many legal authorities that can be used. And, you know, we expect um, this administration to explore every option available because, as we've mentioned over the last hour, there's too much at stake and too many people's lives and our families' livelihoods are on the line here. Um, so inaction is simply not an option. Um, so on decision day, we will be heading to the Supreme Court at 12 p.m. Eastern time. Um, if you are in the area, come join us. Um, we will be there if it's a good decision or if it's a bad decision um, because this movement never stops and um, the, the debt crisis, um, we, we still got a lot of work to do to make sure that that becomes truly a thing of the past. Uh, so with that, I would like to thank all of our speakers today, all of our respective teams that helped to put this conversation together um, and thank each and every one of you for taking some time out of your day um, to, to learn and to um, better yourselves as an advocate and as a, a, a partner in this in this fight for, for student debt justice. Um, and so we are very grateful for you and have a great Monday. Thank you, folks. <laughs>